Thanks for downloading the podcast about the ideas behind the news. Over recent decades, there's been a revolution in family structures, with almost half the children in Britain now born to unmarried parents. Will that make a difference to those children's lives? The BBC's education editor, Branwyn Jeffries, investigates. What kind of wristbands are you wearing? Green wristbands. Who knows where you need to go when I call for green wristbands? Up there, it's a 360 party. Can you all see it? Okay, but who's excited? And who wants to go and play? Okay, off you go. Hi, welcome to 360. Have you guys been here before? Yes. I'm going on the big slide and going on my belly. Are you going on your belly, are you? Yeah, on the big slide. Big slide, okay. It's the end of the day, and at this soft play centre in Milton Keynes, families are, families are just relaxing and having fun together. All kinds of families come here. Married couples, single parents, couples who are living together. But when they all go home, could those different family structures make a difference to the children's long-term prospects and well-being? It's a deeply sensitive subject, but it does matter. In this week's analysis, we hear about two long-term studies, both trying to measure the impact of differing family structures on children's health, education and behaviour, one here in the UK and the other in the United States. But first, I wanted to know what parents here think. So my name's Hayley and I'm here with my daughter. I've been a single parent, so speaking from that standpoint, sometimes being a single parent, you have more time to be with your children because you don't have to consider other people's feelings into the mix as well. I don't think that being a single parent necessarily makes you any any less sort of able to spend time with your children or quality time. I think actually, in, in many respects, you you know, you can kind of immerse yourself more in meeting the needs of your children and not needing to worry so much about meeting the needs of anybody else. Not having to look after a man at the same time. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. Raspberries? Berries. That's what you think it is, a raspberry. Apples. Apples. I think it's just, it's just differences. I didn't feel like I missed out being from a single parent family. It was all I knew, so it didn't really have a that big a impact I don't think I think it's just different experiences what I see with my mum was a with me and my brother and sister she was a single parent as well I think it's the energy level so when you've got two of you you're kind of balancing off of each other and when one's tired the other one's taking the reins a little bit and that does him the world of good because if you're a single parent and you're drained and you're tired they still need love and attention and affection and changing and feeding and you've just got to do it whereas if one of us is tired the other one can kind of take over a little bit and I think that does make a big difference being from a single parent family and kind of seeing some of the mistakes that I witnessed I, I decided how I wanted to be as a dad and I think it did shape my, my ways with him. Parents in Milton Keynes sharing their experiences but large long-term studies following children as they grow up are providing evidence that family structure does make a measurable difference. They're capturing the impact of social changes which began in the 60s. We'll be hearing later what academics in the UK have found as children are tracked from birth to their teenage years. But first, to the United States, where the growing numbers of single mothers supported by welfare attracted the interest of a young sociologist – Sarah McClanahan is now a professor at Princeton University, where she oversees what's called the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. Two things set this research apart. It was explicitly asking questions about what it meant for children growing up with unmarried parents. And, from the outset, fathers were included. So I wanted to hear from Professor McClanahan at length about her work – But first, I was curious, what was her own experience of being a parent? Well, I had three children. I was about 21 years old when I had my first child. I was married for 10 years to their father, and then I got divorced, and I went back to school and got my BA degree and then my PhD degree. So I was a single mother for 10 years, 
And then I married my current husband. So did this experience, yourself of being a single parent, draw you towards this area of research? Yes, definitely. I had been sort of taught as a sociologist that there were no negative consequences of divorce or single parenthood. And in those days, it was almost all about divorce. So I studied, um, I looked at all the data sets that I could find. And over and over again, um, as I looked at these studies, I found that there were negative consequences, which, of course, is not at all what my original intention was. And why, when you look at the scale of changes in society, did you think this was so important? Dating back to the 60s, but also really increasing in the 80s, was this shift to single motherhood via never marrying the father. And so I got interested in what are the consequences of the children born to unmarried parents. Sarah McClanahan started thinking about the challenges faced by many of these families, She knew already that in many cases, women weren't receiving any financial support from the fathers. So, from their difficult circumstances came the name, fragile families. Twenty years ago, 5,000 children and their parents were recruited into the study in big US cities. I wanted to know, who were these fragile families? The big findings from the first year was sort of high hopes and low capabilities. So it surprised a lot of people in the U.S. that half of these unmarried parents were living together at the time the child was born, whereas the earlier studies were saying about a quarter. We also found that the fathers were contributing a lot during the pregnancy, that uh, they had helped the mother both with uh, support as well as money. Uh, We found that 95% of the mothers wanted the fathers to be involved, and 94% of the fathers said they wanted to be involved. So there were high hopes. On the other hand, the parents in the fragile families study were very low educated, very high percent black and Hispanic as compared to white, much younger than married mothers, and much in much poor health and health behaviors. So in all of the areas of resources, these were not um, your average family. These were very disadvantaged families. So as you followed them over the years, what became clear about what this meant for the children and the children's lives and how they were turning out? The bottom line is there's an enormous amount of instability. Partnership changes. So a lot of the mothers who do start out cohabiting with the father, most of those relationships end by the time the children are five and nine years old. And then the mother goes on to have... Uh, to look and have another partner that she may live with. And she may have a child with that second partner. And then that relationship may end. And so the children in these families are exposed to a lot of changes in the partnership composition of the household. They also end up with many half-siblings. When you looked at the children's Mm -hmm. education, their emotional well-being, their behavior. How did it look for the children? It looked worse in every dimension. And some of that is due to the fact that these children have less educated parents, they have lower incomes, and all of those things. But even after you take those factors into account, there was there's an additional uh, negative consequence associated with the partnership changing. So the children, they do worse on cognitive uh, tests. They do worse in behavior, especially social-emotional behavior problems. Uh, There's also more asthma, worse sleep patterns, um, lots of just health problems as compared to children raised in stable two-parent families. The latest results from the study reveal significant differences. Children raised by single parents, parents living together or in an unstable marriage were 50% more likely to show difficulties with behaviour than children growing up within a settled marriage. 
they were more likely to struggle through school. Early research suggested that being brought up in a fragile family doubled the chances of not graduating from high school. All the evidence is that increases the likelihood of being unemployed or in low-paid work. In other words, a lifelong disadvantage. I asked Professor McClanahan how she could be so sure that these results are due to the parents' marital status and not other differences. Well, you can do that statistically by taking, uh, comparing parents who have had the same amount of other instabilities, but one has also had the instability of partnership, and the other family has not. And. Is the effect of being unmarried really worse than some of the other effects that we're talking about? So I think what you're asking is, what if you were unmarried, a stable single mother, who's lived in the same house and never had a partner? There are a few of those mothers, and the research does show their children do worse. And if you think about it, why do they do worse? They have one parent time instead of two. And were these results consistent enough for you to be absolutely sure that you were seeing an effect that was linked to the to the family setup? Yes, yes, I think so. Parent time and money is what parents have to invest in their children. So when you only have one parent you're going to have less time and money, even though many, about a third of the unmarried fathers do stay involved with their children, even after they've ended the relationship with the mother. But they don't stay nearly as involved as the married fathers. And one of the things that's interesting about this, or sad, I guess you could say, is that during the last 20 years, there's been a large increase in fathers' involvement with children. And so at the, during the period when the edu- highly educated fathers are spending more time with their children, the less than college educated fathers are spending much less, primarily because they're not living with their children. What worries me the most is I see this as really contributing to a growing gap between the children born to educated parents and the children born to less educated parents. So it's, it's increasing inequality. The high proportion of black and Hispanic American families followed up in the research also showed how other inequities in society could disrupt a child's upbringing. This was particularly true for the involvement of their fathers. At the time of the birth, about 40% of the unmarried fathers reported having been in jail or prison at some point in their lives. And then during the first five, nine years of the study, we saw many other fathers go to jail uh, and come out of jail. And this has a huge negative effect on the family, um, especially on children where the father had been either living with the child or making contributions to the child. So there's a big movement now in the U.S. to reduce uh, high rates of incarceration. And because this whole phenomena disproportionately affects African-American families and children, it sort of again contributes to more uh, racial disparities in this country. Your study includes thousands of families, but Given the complexity of families and of day-to-day living, how can you be sure that the families you studied give you reliable enough findings to make these conclusions? Well, we can't run an experiment where we have kids who are exactly alike and we assign one to live in a fragile family or be born to a fragile family and one to be uh, born to a stable two-parent family. So we can never rule out that some of the factors that are affecting those choices are responsible for the poor child outcomes. But we have lots of econometric and statistical approaches for Uh, dealing with these issues. And my sense is at the end of the day, uh, there there is a causal effect of these family changes on child well-being. I don't think it's gigantic. It's not as big as the effect of mother's education. 
But it's big enough to be a concern, and it's big enough to increase inequality. Do you worry that your findings are open to being hijacked by people who might want to draw quite different conclusions about how particularly women should lead their lives? Definitely. Yes, there are people who would like to say, you know, if we just get everybody married, everything will be okay. And, you know, I definitely don't think that would fix things at all. I think we have to fix a lot of the the societal conditions that are making it so hard for these parents to have a stable relationship. You talked about delaying parenthood. And, of course, a lot of women who have access to education do exactly that and wait to have their children later. Could that help close the gap between the best off the wealthiest families and the poorest? We have to offer something other than just saying delay childbearing. We have to sort of say, if you, if you delay childbearing, you're going to have more resources, you're going to have more autonomy in your life. Back to the UK and a married mum at the Soft Play Centre reflecting on whether marriage makes a difference. My name is Shankari and I'm here with my husband Matt and our daughter, Nisha. I've got a few friends who are single mums and I think they definitely talk about that some things just have to give. So, you know, I say, how do you manage, you know, when do you have a shower and when do you look after yourself? I say, yeah, well, they just have to wait. There's nothing else, you know, they just have to wait. Whereas I think in our house she's a bit spoiled in the sense that we would make sure that one of us has her if the other one's going to be off going somewhere for a little while, even within the house. I'm sure everyone's doing the best they can. There's no judgment here. It's just I really, I don't, yeah, I can imagine it being really difficult to get that balance when you're on your own. So what does the research here show? An even bigger study in the UK has been following 19,000 children and their families since the year 2000. It's not set up to look at family structures, but because of its size, it does provide a wealth of data by following a big slice of a generation. And unlike the Fragile Families research in the US, it's not based in cities, so it is more representative of the population as a whole. Professor Emla Fitzsimons leads the team analysing the rich data from the Millennium Cohort study. Their latest research paper reinforces the impact of instability and change on children's lives. For the first time in the UK, it looked at the effect of children's age on how they coped with their parents separating. So we find that children who experience a breakup are 16% more likely to display um, an increase in emotional problems and they're 8% uh, more likely to display a rise in conduct problems in the short term. And what's happening in that experience to the children that has that effect? Is it about money? Is it about maybe moving home or school? Is it about the conflict between the parents? Do we know We don't look at that in this particular research. Um, What we do find is that it tends to be more detrimental if the split occurs relatively late in childhood, so between the ages of around 7 and 11, compared to if it occurs early on. And we can speculate as to why that's the case. So, for instance, it may be an age where a split may be more disruptive to children's peer relationships. It may involve moving home. It may involve moving school. There may be a level of conflict in the household that happens before the split. And in the study, we find evidence that it is quite detrimental. Some people will find it very hard to hear the extent of the impact of a separation on children in general. Are you saying that people should stay together? Is that what people should take from this? Absolutely not. I think we're doing the research and we're providing the evidence around what's happening in young people's lives. We're not judging people or or saying, you know, what people should or should not be doing. On average, we're saying that this is the effect we observe if you take a large population study. But obviously, there'll be lots of variation across households. and, And that's important to bear in mind. But there are significant differences between the UK and the United States when it comes to marriage, as Professor Fitzsimons explained. I think an important point to make is the fact that compared to the US, for instance, cohabiting unmarried parents in the UK are much more similar than they are in the US. So, for instance, they have fairly similar levels of economic circumstances, income levels and so on, educational attainment. And that's quite different to the situation in the US where cohabiting parents tend to be more similar to single parents. 
So unlike the American research, the findings in the UK are more about the differences between couples bringing up children together and single parents managing on their own. What can it tell us about different family types and their children? We tend to see that children born to cohabiting parents have slightly lower educational attainment and do slightly less well in terms of their socio-emotional development. So how does the picture look when you then start comparing parents bringing up children together and a parent on their own? Well, we carry out assessments with the children every couple of years. We measure basic skills such as numeracy and literacy and we tend to see they're doing less well in those assessments compared to children born to uh, married or cohabiting couples. We also measure their socio-emotional development, so their behavioural difficulties, for instance, which tend to be higher. We measure their well-being, um, levels of depressive symptoms, so how they're feeling, their levels of anxiety and so on, and we tend to see they're doing worse also on that dimension. It's when you look at girls that the differences are particularly striking. The research found signs of depression in 22% of teenage girls growing up with both parents. For girls in a single parent home, that rose to 27%. Again, a large part of the differences are explained by the fact that they're coming from poorer households where their mothers tend to have lower levels of education. They're also explained by the fact that family instability tends to be higher in single parent households. So we know that children who are exposed to things such as multiple partnership changes in their childhood or general instability during their childhood tend to fare out worse in terms of cognitive attainment and well-being. And once you take into account all those economic factors that uh, single parents may have had less education, may have less money to start out, and then, of course, they're managing on their own with a child, is there still an effect separate from that that we can see in this study? There is still a difference between the outcomes of children born to single uh, parent households versus married or cohabiting, yes, even when you take into account the fact that they tend to be from poorer homes. But I would say much of the difference is due to the instability that's occurring in their lives in terms of the partnership changes that may be happening within their homes and that tends to explain quite a lot of the difference in, in their outcomes. When you look at the single parents who are in the study, what are their own life experiences that they're bringing to this in terms of the opportunities they've had, their age when they're becoming a parent, things that might have quite a powerful influence on their ability to parent their own children? We know that they tend to have lower levels of education on average compared to married and cohabiting parents and that affects their employment prospects and the income that they bring to the household. We know that they tend to be younger on average when they have their first child. We know that they tend to have higher levels of mental ill health than those who are married and cohabiting. And I think there's a really important and and complex interplay between economic resources, education level and mental health that together can really shape how children develop and can provide an important context for parenting and be really, really important for children's outcomes. How much of this is not so much around perhaps parenting skills, but about capacity? In other capacity, you're talking about one person instead of two to manage all the daily routines that we know children find incredibly important as they're growing up that has to play an important role. In other research, we looked specifically at obesity levels in childhood across uh, different family structures, and we found that the group most at risk were children living with single mothers who were working full time. Now, why is that the case? We can hypothesise that perhaps it's due to the fact that they simply have less time to spend with their children. They have less time to prepare home-cooked meals that we know may be more nutritious. They have less time to supervise activity make sure they're getting the right amount of physical exercise and so on. So there are more demands on their time. Just to be clear, neither of these academics argues the solution is for all parents to be married. But given what they find, what do they think to the lives of children? So we have evidence from the study that The mother's mental health is very, very important for children's well-being and for children's own mental health. 
And that suggests it may be important to target mothers and provide them with support. That might be something important for policymakers to think about. You try to pinpoint what factors in these families can close that gap between the children. Delaying childbearing is really important until you've found the right partner. I also think that policies that promote other kinds of stability, sort of stable housing, policies that keep the schools from changing, keep employment or child care facilities stable. So as much as we can provide stability in other aspects of children's lives, I think those are important. Some fear that this all sounds too much like blaming single parents. Sarah McClanahan knows all too well that research findings can be hijacked by other agendas. So I wanted to know whether she thinks it's realistic to change individual decisions based on all the messy complexity of our lives as a result of this research. Everything I'm saying is not for a particular woman. It's sort of, it's about on average, this is what happens. So some women may be able to pull this off with have a child very young and raise the child on their own. Um, I would definitely say avoid having lots of different partners living in the household at various times. Sarah, parents are often hardest on themselves. They ask themselves hard questions about whether they've done a good enough job. Knowing what you know from all this research, do you worry whether your own children might have been disadvantaged in some respect? Definitely, definitely. There are things I wish I'd done differently. What parent wouldn't say the same? Those with small children know how hard it is day to day and are least inclined to judge each other. But yeah, I'm not 100% sure if it really matters whether there's one or two or three people committed to raising a child. I'm sure families who aren't financially as well off as others or don't have the support are still raising their kids just as well as others are because all they really need is someone to love them, I think. I can't imagine anything else being more important. I don't think it really matters who parents. I think what matters is that people have the capacity to enjoy parenting and really to kind of embrace it. And children really ask very little of you. As a parent, if you can just accept that you do know what you're doing and, and trust that instinct, really. The period of time that your children really need you is so fleeting. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a, parenting's fantastic. It's the best job in the world. It's the most rewarding job in the world. Analysis was presented by Bramwyn Jeffries and produced by Diane Richardson. On a similar note, you might want to scroll back in our podcast feed and listen to the episodes on the Pupil Premium and the one on screens and teams. Both excellent. In the next podcast, James Tilley finds out what conspiracy theories tell us about politics and voters. It's a goodie, so do subscribe to the feed. We like to hear from you. We're on Facebook and also on email. Analysis at bbc.co.uk. Keep it locked.